Well, hello, everyone. This is Pastor Mark Tinsley, and uh, we're in Tuesday, April 7th, 2020. Uh, we're still doing remote worship here, a remote church, as it were, and uh, I'm going to continue these Bible studies until we come back. I'm going to do them every weekday, Monday through Friday, uh, have them available to you in the morning so you can look at them throughout the day, and I hope they're helpful, helpful and I uh, hope they keep you encouraged. And like I've said many times, uh, we are looking at uh, the book Foundations, 260-Day Bible Reading Plan for Busy Believers by Robbie and Candy Galati, a study that I did in the past, and I want to share with you now as I go through it a second time. And I'm happy that you're joining me on this journey. Again, we'll sometimes we'll stick to what the Galatis are talking about. Sometimes I'll go off on a tangent to offer my own commentary all the time. Uh, but uh, I love this study because it takes you through virtually the entire Bible. It picks and chooses, um, the, as it were, the important chapters uh, of the Bible, the ones that the real meat and potatoes of Scripture, and takes you through the journey through the Old Testament into the New Testament. I love it. You'll love it, I think. If and We'll go on as long as we, as we can with this study. Uh, today, we're in Job chapters 40 through 42, so three chapters today. They're shorter. I'm going to read those in a minute, talk about them a little bit, but first, let's pray. Father, uh, I want to thank you so much again for this day. Thank you for the book of Job and the comfort that it gets us, gives us, shows us how we can be comforted and what we can learn from God through suffering and trial. May we learn something today in these concluding chapters of the book of Job. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so these are the concluding chapters of Job. 42 is the last chapter in the book of Job, so let's get to it. Chapter 40, verse 1. And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. And here's Job's response. Then Job answered the Lord, See, I am, a, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but will proceed no further. Verse 6, Then the Lord answered Job, Out of a whirlwind. So this is God speaking again. Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you declare to me, Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on all who are proud and abase them. Look on all who are proud and bring them low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you victory. Look at Behemoth, which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. Its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its belly. It makes its tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit together. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs like bars of iron. It is the first of the great acts of God. Only its maker can approach it with a sword. For the mountains yield food for it, where all the wild animals play. Under the lotus plants it lies, in the covert of the reeds and in the marsh. The lotus trees cover it for shade. The willows of the wadi surround it. Even if the river is turbulent, it is not frightened. It is confident, though Jordan rushes against its mouth. Can one take it with hooks or pierce its nose with a snare? Chapter 41. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down its tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it make many supplications to you? Will it speak soft words to you? Will it make a covenant with you to be taken as your servant forever? Will you play with it? as with a bird, or will you put it on leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its skin with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? Lay hands on it. Think of the battle 
you will not do it again. Any hope of capturing it will be disappointed. Were not even the gods overwhelmed at the sight of it? No one is so fierce as to dare to stir it up. Who can stand before it? Who can confront it and be safe under the whole heaven? Who? I will not keep silence concerning its limbs or its mighty strength or its splendid frame. Who can stir? Who can strip off its outer garment? Who can penetrate its double coat of mail? Who can open the doors of its face? There is terror all around its teeth. Its back is made of shields in rows, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. Its sneezes flash forth light, and its eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. From its mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap out. Out of its nostrils comes smoke, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. Its breath kindles coals, and a flame comes out of its mouth. In its neck abides strength, and terror dances before it. The folds of its flesh cling together. It is firmly cast and immovable. Its heart is as hard as stone, as hard as, hard as the lower millstone. When it raises itself up, the gods are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches it, it does not avail, nor does the spear, the dart, or the javelin. It counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make it flee. Slingstones for it are turned to chaff. Clubs are counted as chaff. It laughs at the rattle of javelins. Its underparts are like sharp potsherds. It spreads itself like threshing sledge on the mire. It makes the deep boil like a pot. It makes the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a shining wake behind it. No one, one would think the deep to be white-haired. On earth, it has no equal, a creature without fear. It surveys everything that is lofty. It is king over all that are proud. And then finally, chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord. So now Job is speaking again. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have spoken of me what sorry, for have you, you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has done. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shumite, and Zophar, the Namathite, went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comfort him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him, and each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemiah, the second Keziah, and the third 
Karen Hapuk. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations. And Job died old and full of days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's a couple of things I want to point out about Job chapters 40 through 42, the concluding chapters of this wonderful book, one of my favorite books in the Bible. And the first is that Job spends all this time in the, the bulk of the book kind of complaining, doubting. We talked about that yesterday. And then in chapters 38 and 39, what we see is God come back and chastise Job, sort of school Job for uh, his doubt, for his, you know, his, he didn't lose faith, but he was very much uh, frustrated with God, questioning God, right? And God chastises him and says, what are you doing? Who do you, where were you when I made the foundations of the earth? Who among you can count the clouds, right? And he ends in verse 40, chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. He says, God says, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. So God says, tell me what you think, Job. Now, sometimes we get chastised by God, don't we? And, and maybe not verbally like this, but we feel, you know, we feel conviction of the Holy Spirit. We feel uh, maybe a little guilt, as it were. We read God's Word, and it convicts us in our hearts, right, of, of, our, of our sinfulness, of our wrongdoing against God. But sometimes, and I know this has been the case for me sometimes in the past, I know it has been for you as well, sometimes we sort of, we either ignore that conviction or sometimes we just outright don't respond to it. Um, uh, maybe even, uh, uh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, we, we, just, we just don't respond to that conviction, do we? Um, but Job does respond to that conviction. Look what he says. Um, then Job answered the Lord, see, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. In other words, Job says, you know what? I'm going to shut up because you're right, God. What you're saying is spot on. I am in the wrong. I've opened my mouth. I've said things that I shouldn't have said. I've thought things that I shouldn't have thought. I've not been as faithful as I should have been. And folks, that is the response that God wants from us. Contrite hearts, obedience, and humility. How many times have we not been contrite and humble and obedient? How many times have we, again, thumbed our nose at God, ignored God's conviction? Maybe even contradicted. That was the word I'm looking for a minute ago. Maybe even contradicted God's conviction. Or convinced ourselves in some way that, nah, it's not really. It wasn't so bad, right? That sin wasn't so bad. That disobedience wasn't so bad. I'm not as bad as the other guy down the road, right? Or the other gal down the road. God doesn't want excuses. He doesn't want pride. He doesn't want uh, contradiction. He doesn't want justification. What he wants is humility, contriteness, and obedience. And that's what God, uh, Job shows us in chapter 40, verses, what, uh, 3 through 5 there. Okay? Now, verse 6 in, cha in chapter 40, God kind of goes back on it. He goes through this narrative of behemoth and leviathan. And this is very confusing. Commentators uh, have really spent a lot of time over the years on these verses. I just want to summarize them very quickly. I think it's God coming back and he's talking about these, these huge beasts that whatever Behemoth and, and Leviathan are, we don't, you know, again, commentators don't know what they are exactly, but they were big beasts that Job would have been familiar with. And basically, and this is my interpretation here, okay, so take it for what it's worth, but basically what I think God is doing here is he's saying, look at these majest, these beasts of majesty, these majestic beasts of the world, these huge, uh, complex, uh, just uh, wonderful and kind of scary beasts that God had created. And he kind of goes into the complexities of both Behemoth and Leviathan. 
And I think it's in an effort to, again, kind of school Job. He, he's kind of putting a period or an excla- exclamation mark on the end of the sentence here. Job has said, okay, I need to shut my mouth. And God goes, yeah, you do, because look. And he kind of goes back into this narrative again in talking about these huge beasts to once again convince Job that Job is just a little guy in this big world. That Job didn't create these majestic beasts, but God did. Job didn't have a hand in any of these things, but God did. Job didn't create the complexities where, where the scales fit together so tightly that not even air passed through, he talks about. Did Job do that? No, Job didn't do that. And after all of that, we get to chapter 42, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord. So God schools Job again. Then Job says, and I think this is one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. In other words, he recognizes God's majesty and all omnipotence, his all-powerfulness. Verse 3, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? In other words, he kind of, kind of saying, who am I to go against you, God? So he's admitting here through a rhetorical question that he's wrong, right? He doesn't have the ability to counsel God. It's not him. He should not be counseling God, not the little guy he is, the created being that he is. It's not his place to counsel God. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. In other words, he says, I'm, I'm just a simple being. I'm a simple created being. I, I, I don't understand the things of God. I don't understand the creative act. I don't understand why God does the things he does. So who am I to try to contradict God or question God? Verse 4, he says, here I will speak. I will question you and, and, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. He says in verse 5, I had heard of you. I'd heard the things. I'd spoken everything. But now I've seen with my own eyes how wonderful and great you are. You have opened my eyes, God, to my insignificance. You've opened my eyes to who I am as your servant, as your created being. And then he says, and I repent. And folks, this is where God wants us to be. He wants us to be at the point of repentance. If we get to the point of repentance, then we have done what God has called us to do. God does not want, God doesn't expect us to be perfect, right? He knows we're sinners. That's why he sent Jesus Christ. God doesn't expect us to do everything right all the time. God doesn't expect us, right, to be infallible. He's infallible. He doesn't expect us to be all-powerful. He's all-powerful. He doesn't expect us to be all-knowing. He's all-knowing. But what he does expect is when we mess up, when we don't do it right, that we're humble, contrite, and obedient enough to say, I am sorry and I repent of my sins. I turn away from them and turn back to you. And that's what Job does. And we all know the result, don't we? Verse 10 of chapter 42. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, because God instructed him to pray for his friends. And God gave Job twice as much as he had before. And then the last verse, and Job died old and full of days. In other words, God blessed him. God said, you repented. You were obedient, contrite, and humble. Because of that, I'm going to bless you. Now, Job got blessed with kids again, right? He got blessed with sheep and oxen and and wealth again, twice as much as he had had before. It's not to say that we're all going to get blessed with material blessings like Job did, but God will bless us. And it may be peace and joy in our hearts, but hey, what's what's better than peace and joy in our hearts? But whatever it is, God blesses those who are repentant. God blesses those who are contrite, obedient, and humble. God will bless you and he'll bless me if we act and react like Job did. In the face of our failures, our faults, our sin, if we repent, God will bless us. Again, he'll bless us all differently, but we'll all receive some blessing from him. Notice nothing happens positive in Job's life until he repents. 
then things change. What about you? Are you repenting in your life? What are the sins that you're dealing with right now? What are the things that are holding you back from a full and blossoming relationship with God? That's my question for you today, and that's what I want you to go away with. Here on April 7th, 2020, what's holding you back? Whatever it is, repent of it today. In fact, as soon as you hit, hit, you click off of this video, I want you to pray. I want you to go into a time of prayer, and I want you to pray to God. I want you to com, uh, commit your sins to Him. I want you to repent them to Him. Let Him take those away today. Let's pray. Father, thank You for repentance. Thank You for the story of Job and what we can learn from him. Thank You for being a God who listens to us hears our prayers, and responds with blessing to those who are contrite, humble, and obedient. May we all be contrite and humble and obedient today, and may we start it right now. Not, not later today, not tomorrow, but today, right now. Give us repentant hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going back into Genesis tomorrow. I told you we were, we were going to be out of Genesis for a little bit. Now we're going back, Genesis chapters 11 and 12. For tomorrow, Wednesday, I'll see you then.